It's time! The ATM, the Apologise to Me podcast. My name is Martin Devlin from the platform. The one, the only, the man who has opinions and is strong enough of character to actually voice those sports opinions is Mark Watto Watson. Watto, welcome back, mate. Yeah, lovely to be on the show, Marty. School holidays this week, so I'm sort of having to do this remotely. And I've got to say, mate, the best thing, uh, the thing I love about doing this podcast with you is I get to sit opposite you and I get to look into your eyes, Martin. I okay, well, that's weird. Okay, so what we what we might do is we might F Boy Island that whole thing, mate, and we we might. We might talk about sport. We're going to go Women's Rugby World Cup because it kicks off this weekend. The Kiwi squad has just got one Warriors player in it. And, and and no reaction from the Warriors yet about that, which I think is disappointing. Man City, are they just too good? Or is the Champions League going to trip them up? The WRC, should the government be funding this? Or maybe the question mark is, why won't the government fund it? And if Ian Foster told Auckland to play Roger on the wing, would you mind he is the All Black coach after all? Apologise to me! But let's kick it off, obviously, with the Women's Rugby World Cup. Twelve teams have arrived. Yesterday was a bit of a welcome. It all kicks off this weekend. And on the back of what Sport New Zealand came out, which I just thought is not only arrogant, it's also patronising last week, telling everyone that it's about time we all started watching women's sport. We're adults here, Mark. We've spoken about this before. Rather than telling us what to do, why don't you actually uh, provide a whole lot of really good reasons why people will watch and provide some maybe some framework around that as well. Instead, what we've got is we've got Spark. Greedy old Spark have got this, so it's not on free-to-air. Some of it is delayed, but delayed coverage, no one watches that anyway. So I think that they've... it's. It's almost prohibitive to watch for a lot of people, which is really disappointing to me. This tournament should be on TVNZ, and it should be all live. Yeah, look, first and foremost, um, let's just touch on your original point. Yeah, I do not need people telling me what I should watch, and if I choose not to watch it, be labelled as a misogynist or anti-women, anything like that. You know and I know, Martin, we love a lot of women's sport. We enjoy watching women's tennis. I love women's track and love field, the hockey, uh, women's swimming. I th- I, yeah, I think netball is a great package mm. as well. But stop telling me what I should watch and being able to get away with it in a political environment where if anyone comes out and says the opposite, well, particularly in jobs like broadcasting, we can very easily lose our jobs. Well, you know, I'm really pleased that it's looking like Eden Park will be a bit of a sellout Same. on Saturday. And, and I think that's great because, look, it is a World Cup. There's a novelty factor. And let's not kid ourselves. There are three games you're going to watch. And this is going to be very enticing. You've got South Africa, France, Fiji, England, and you've got Australia and New Zealand. So, of course, you're getting three games. You should be going along. But as I've said in the past, I hope that all the feminists are there. I hope it's all women that are going. Yes, I, I hope it's all yeah. these um, people, and th- these women journalists who continually accuse men of being chauvinists who continue to push this that you know the, the patriarchy has dominated women over years and hey we don't just want equality now we actually want revenge I hope they're the ones that are all tuning up and watching well they have to Mark they've got to be there because if they're not they're full of it rhymes with bit and starts with an SH mate if that's not the case women have to be there watching it's the, it's women who are not watching women's sport And so stop telling us men what to do, like you do the every day of our goddamn lives, and actually start pointing the finger at the women who are sports fans and say, and asking that question. And this is my frustration, mate. Why won't any of these organisations from New Zealand Rugby, Sport New Zealand, everyone else, they're they're all full of the tally off, but why won't any of them start doing the research that uncovers the answer to the question, why won't women in great numbers watch women's sport in this country? Yeah, well, perhaps it's just not actually a good enough product. Maybe and that's the answer. Admit that perhaps, and what say the answer. that is the answer, Mark? What say right now the product isn't up to it? Look, I, I keep using the analogy. We're in a band, you and me. You play guitar, I play drums. Uh, we both share the vocals. We actually think, God damn, we're good. We put out some great records. No one's buying them because you know what? They're not actually that great. What say that? What say we have to accept that and just say, hey, at the yep. moment the product is here, but it's not yeah, if you know what I mean. But also, too, they've got the benefit of just being given so much media. It's funny, isn't it? Our television and print suddenly think that because the men's versions of rugby and cricket are so popular, they're, you know, cricket is our summer sport, winter is our uh, rugby is our national sport, that because we've enjoyed it, therefore we'll automatically want to watch the women play it. And they're actually two completely different products. I feel for, I feel for our New Zealand track and field female athletes. I feel for our women swimmers, our 
our triathletes, um, a lot of these other teams, even the hockey to a degree, that just simply don't get the coverage. Have been fighting for the Same. coverage for years, work 10 times harder than our women's rugby players, and they do. Let's not get ourselves. I was out watching, I was out the other day at College Rifles, and I was watching uh, for something else, and I was watching the women's Auckland rugby team training. And, and seriously, from the background I come from, it was laughable. And then I'm told to believe that they need to be paid because. It's so encroaching on the rest of their life. You know, the training sessions are so hard and then, hey, we need to be full-time because we're sacrificing so much else in the name of rugby. And I just sit there and go, rubbish, you choose your path. I know a lot of athletes that don't get paid at all who work twice as hard. But this is really frustrating because it's, it, here it is. It's rugby and cricket getting the coverage, taking it away from what I believe are other athletes who do deserve that Good coverage. Point. And it is it's incredibly great frustrating. Yeah, great point. Incredibly frustrating. Now, we might get 30-odd thousand turning up to Eden Park, but how many people do you think are going to turn up and watch USA, Italy? How many people are going to turn up and watch Japan, Canada, Wales, Scotland in the days coming, whether it be at Waitakere Stadium, Eden Park, or up north? Uh, this will be the fascinating thing for me. It is a World Cup, as I said. It's always going to have a novelty factor to it. But yeah, it's um, but yeah. Please don't accuse me and label me for not wanting to turn up and watch it. For me, when I'm in a in a hosting capacity on a radio station, deciding that I don't believe there's enough interest in it for me to warrant. I'm not saying around the Women's World Cup. I'm just saying in general for me to sort of say, yeah, I think we need to do something on this tonight, or I think we need to do something on this during the day. Apologise to me. Topic number two then, Kiwi squad, just one Warriors player in it. Uh, and forget the fact that Sean Johnson was added to the wider squad. He was never going to the World Cup, let's be honest about it. Jason Costo Costigan, uh, who called the Warriors, as you know, what, for 10 years, was on the program yesterday and he said, Marty, he said, I'll say this because no one else will say it and you won't like it in New Zealand. He said, mate, but the fact of the matter is, and I'm only just imitating his voice, of course, I'm not taking the piddle out of it, but and it, his, his, his point is absolutely valid. He said, no good player, no great player, no decent player, no really competent Kiwi player wants to come and play for the Warriors and he said that's the goddamn truth and that is the truth this Warriors squad you would you would think because we're a one team country that this squad should be synonymous with the Kiwis there should be a parallel with the Kiwis we should have half the Kiwis should we not oh yeah oh, I just had to laugh at the he headline around Sean John Johnson snubbed no he wasn't snubbed he's lucky enough to make the Warriors starting lineup. exactly right snubbed yeah, he's just simply not. Oh, he's good passed enough. his he best. No, we... look, he's, he's passed his best. We... Let's be honest about it. Last year, he was injury prone. The year before, injury prone. The year before that, I can't even remember when he played a consistent season. And I'm not dumping on the guy, but your time's up, mate. That's all there is to it. You're not going to win the Warriors a premiership. You're not taking us to the eight. You're not going to make the Kiwis a better side. Yeah. That's just what happens in sport. Your time is done. Yeah, but I, I'm not even surprised why the media or anyone jumps up and down. Oh, the Warriors don't have any... What do you expect when you finish 14th, 15th and 16th? What do you expect when you're at the bottom of the table? We all know that not one of those Warriors, or maybe bar two, showed any heart, showed any commitment. They just simply jumped and hit behind a whole lot of excuses that were manufactured by the organisation about, oh, being away from home and a change in coach and you just don't get it, you know, and COVID and all the other excuses. You know, they'll all be back playing next year at home, they'll all have another new coach and the results will be exactly the same. You know, I'm really pleased. You know, this is one thing the Warriors have got to stop doing. You don't need to be a development club for New Zealand rugby. Let all the other clubs pick up our talent and develop it. You know, I enjoy watching Isaiah Papalihi playing same. for Parramatta yeah, on the yeah. weekend. Same. Yeah. You know, Warriors, just go and get 13 hardened Australians if that's what's just required win. to win. Just win, baby. But just also, win. You, if but you also got to have a look at the management, the ownership of the Warriors, and they are doing New Zealand rugby a disservice by their own, you know, head in the sand, or oh, we'll turn it around, I'm the guy, and I'm the right owner, and we've got the vision, and you guys don't get it. No, you're not the right owner, you're not the right management, and you don't get it, and as long as you guys put yourself ahead of the game, the Warriors are always going to be minnows, and yes, any young kid coming through in New Zealand's going to start to go or a long time ago when Stacey and the boys were at the home I sort of wanted to play for the Warriors because I also want to be a Kiwi everyone's going to go it's a bit like Auckland rugby you know there was, there's a period where hey if you've got a young kid coming through Auckland rugby and he's got some ability when they get out of school you send them to Canterbury because you knew they weren't going to make it through the Auckland system and that's now what's happening oh well don't play for the Warriors you're going to go nowhere 
you know, you're not going to be a Kiwi. And that's not going to actually help the club in the long term, is it? Apologise to me! Topic number three, I'm standing up for this because I'm still a bit sore after what happened at Etihad Stadium in Manchester in the early hours of yesterday morning. Man City, Erlen Haaland scores a hat-trick every single game. No, they're not top of the table, mate. They're still unbeaten. They're the only unbeaten team. What? Two, two, two parts to this question, mate. Are they completely unstoppable when it comes to the Premier League? And my answer to that is yes, they will win this in an absolute canter. But can you compare them to the greatest sides in Europe? And my answer to that is no, not yet. They're, they're flying the ointment and the rock under the beach towel and the flea in the ear of Pep Guardiola is the Champions League. And unless they win the Champions League, there is always going to be that question. Yeah, look, I agree. What if they won five um, Drawn two. titles, I think? In oh, no, sorry, four and five, mate. Four and five they've won, yeah, in five years, yeah. Yeah, four and five, and arguably going to win five and six, because I agree with you. Everybody else is playing for second at the moment. This Erling Harling, he's taken that position of striker uh, in a different direction. You know, often you have great players that come along that change the landscape, that change the evolution of the game. You know, we saw it with Michael Jones in the number seven jersey. I think we're going to see a new type of superstar come through in Haaland and he's just He's just a beast of a isn't man, it, isn't and he's he? just so intimidating. Twenty-two years of age, he'll, he'll you know he'll score forty plus goals. Oh, he'll score fifty goals, mate. There's no question about it. But what I like it. about but, him is he's just but, to me he is that absolute classic prototype striker. He is Lewandowski with Gerd Muller with Michael. Uh, well, actually, no, sorry, I'll take Michael on because he actually had a sprint on him um, with uh, 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 Van Nistelrooy. These guys who just are predators. Dennis Law. They just stood in the penalty box and they bashed the ball into the net and it's the hardest thing to do in the game and he's an absolute expert at it. Yeah, but but you're I mean, but you look at it too. I mean how good is Phil Foden at the moment? You've got Bruin, uh, Bernardo Silva, yeah, right. uh Grealish. I mean it's just one hell of a side, isn't it? But you're right. I mean you have to, the one thing that Manchester City hasn't done yet, they can't put them up alongside of United, Liverpool uh, the likes of AC Milan, uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona, you have to win the Champions League. You have to win that to become a genuine super club. And that is the one they haven't won. It's interesting, a few years ago, Liverpool said, look, we want the EPL. It had been 30 years since they'd won it. We want the EPL over the Champions League. I think if you went to Manchester City fans now and said, do you want the EPL or do you want the Champions League? They'll be going, we want the Champions Absolutely. League. Absolutely. But look, I mean, I think they're good enough. I do think they're good enough to go and win both this year. But, you know, it's still on your day, isn't it? They have had a few draws this year. Uh, Manchester City, Newcastle being one of them. Um, and and, and the, sheer, the sheer length of the season, and with now the World Cup coming up, making it even more jam-packed, as I said, individuals like the likes of Haaland will win you a game, but a squad will win you the championship. And the scary thing is these guys have certainly got the squad. But, yeah, I'm with you. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if you look at equity in a brand, Liverpool and Manchester City, uh, Manchester United still sit well and truly much, much higher than Man City. You know, they're still popular in Manchester, but I'm still not sure they're a global brand just yet. Apologise to me! Two topics to go, and one of them is, uh, did Ian Foster have anything at all to do with Roger Tuivasa-Shep playing on the wing for Auckland on the weekend? And if he did so, what the hell, who cares? But before we get to that, the WRC, and I'm big time on this, mate. You know, here we have Sport New Zealand again. Uh, we'll go back into our original topic, telling us what we should be watching. Over 100,000 people went out to the supercars at Pukekohe on the, on the very last time that that track would be put in use. Tens of thousands turned up in the pouring rain and the bit of cold in Auckland over the weekend. All far-flung far places to stand there um, with under a brolly and watch the rally of New Zealand. It's dirty motorsport though, isn't it? Can you imagine the debate going on behind closed doors in the government about whether or not they should fund this? It's an absolute no-brainer. It is a complete and utter tourist postcard of this country. But because it's motorsport, you know that there is just going to be much hand-wringing and, oh no, we can't do that and it's just not part of the politics. It's not part of the politics. This is what I hate about these people is take your stupid hats off for a second and think big picture and think what what is actually going to bring people into this country. Tourism is the number one earner in, in, in New Zealand. We know that. You These figures, 150,000 or more spectators, aren't wrong, Mark. That's my point. You can you can tell them they're wrong every day of their lives, but they're not wrong because they've goddamn chosen to spend their money to watch this stuff. Yeah, Marty, you're preaching to the absolute converted on this one. I think sport, in terms of investing in sport, in terms of driving tourism, is one of the cheapest ways of doing it. You know, we've invested a lot of money in the America's Cup now. 
How big is that globally? I'm not sure, but it's certainly been good in terms of, say, driving the technology and putting New Zealand a little bit on the map. But you've only got to have a look at what. You've only got to even, you know, you speak to most people overseas about New Zealand, they'll always bring up the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. You know, we've got a beautiful country, and what, a, what another way of selling that and showing everyone just how magnificent this country is. But well, this is a government and governments that continue to talk about um, equality and making sure that we're all one, you know, that we, it's, 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 you know, Pacifica community, Māori community, European, Asian community, hey, we're all one, we're just New Zealanders. But then they conveniently, at the same time, they're absolute hypocrites because I think, I think there is a prejudice there. I think that they do stereotype certain sports and certain sports are just not sexy enough and trendy enough and hey it's not rugby and it's not cricket and it's not women's rugby i mean i'm pretty sure that if we had a women's rally down here in this political environment we'd find money to make sure it stayed in this country even though it might not necessarily have the same economic impact to say what wrc is and that's unfortunately the mentality here we're putting money into just grabbing headlines rather than actually what's commercially best for this country see, see what one of the best things you know the biggest what What's the biggest postcard sporting event in the world every year? It's the Tour de France. You watch that, whether you're a cycling fan or not, you go, I just want to go to France. Have you seen those magnificent little villages? Have you seen those magnificent Pyrenees and French Alps? I need to go there. And it just drives their tourism. And I always thought to myself, why don't we um, do a similar thing here? You know, we have the tour down under in Adelaide. Why not bring a, a New Zealand bike tour here where you start down in Glenwalkie, bring them up through... Queenstown, you take them up through the west coast, you might travel them across to the North Island and, you know, really sell this country for a much, much smaller investment than probably what we're currently spending to promote New Zealand internationally through television commercials or through travel companies. And we've got to, you know, we've got to have greater vision here. Sport like nothing else, sport like nothing else brings people together. You know, I, I haven't seen street parades for artists. I haven't seen street parades and ticker tape parades for um, a, a lot of other things New Zealand invests in. But you want a sense of nationality. You want to promote your country. You do it through sport. And you're right. There is a prejudice towards sports like softball, rugby league, motorsport. They're labelled as blue collar. And hey, you know, for a country that, you know, for a left-wing government who continues to talk about uh, unity, they're anything but... Apologise to me! Final topic then, we're going to disagree on this and it's about time we did because we haven't butted heads right throughout this. Ian Foster, if the All Black coach did say anything to the Auckland coaches and say, I want to see Roger on the wing, I think, great, he's the All Black coach. He's going to pick this guy to play for our country. If he wants to see him in, in another position, I don't have a problem with it. Personally, I don't think it actually happened. I think there's autonomy and independence there and I, and I just think it's just one of those media driven loads of bollocks but at the same time would you have a problem with it of course you would because a you got a problem with foster and b you got a problem with roger turvisar so you've got a double problem going on no look they should be completely independent all the mpc coaches should be able to run their own damn program the way they see but they're the ones that are going to end up getting sacked and lose their jobs if they're just dictated to by new zealand rugby i mean we've already had new zealand rugby dictate in and around our super rugby players having rest. There's always been rumours and stuff around, you know, players being played in different positions. They look at the state of super rugby now. The NPC struggling to hang on at the moment. The All Blacks should be completely independent. There should be no influence. You don't see Southgate coming into Liverpool Football Club and saying, hey, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I want to see... Um, Trent Alexander, Alexander I'll defend. I want to see him defend. I want to see him look over his shoulder and look at the guy behind him. That'll never happen, mate. No, but Mark, 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 tell me why you think it's OK for the All Black coach. I'll put this back on you. Give me a, a genuine rational organisation. We've already said New Zealand rugby's too top-heavy, and the problem with that is that we've moved from being rugby fans to All Black fans. Then we've got an All Black coach who's currently saying it's OK to lose as long as we win the World Cup. So we've already agreed in past weeks that we've reduced rugby now down to once every four years. So can you tell me why, Martin, and I want to know, why is it okay in your eyes for the All Black coach to be dictating terms to our provincial coaches on where they'd like to see fringe All Blacks play? Tell me how this is a good thing, Martin. It's a good thing because it's reality, mate, because the reality is is that the pyramid well, goes towards the, the sky. It's not it. an inverted goddamn pyramid, mate. And at the top of the pyramid is this little gold triangle called the All Blacks, which generates all the money for this country, and there is no rugby without it. Without the Rugby World Cup, we don't even have Silver Lake. So the only, only 
thing that matters in New Zealand rugby is the All Blacks winning and winning that Web Ellis thing next year. And if Roger is, is the guy that we need to get to a stage where we can put him on as some kind of weapon, we have to see him play. And we can't we can't experiment with him in a black jersey. The NPC is an experiment, is what it is. It is club rugby, mate. Get over yourself. Go long gone are the days where it was the soul of New Zealand rugby. It's not. It's a bit part player in the game in this country. Okay, it's called hey, reality. Hey, so yeah, but Martin, then don't start jumping up and down and saying that Ian Foster doesn't have the players to pick from because we just don't have the depth. Why don't we have the depth, mate? Because we've got no bottom up, because clowns like you promote a, a top-down approach. And it's no longer the little gold thing at the top of the pyramid. Ian Foster's taken it. It's gone from gold to silver to bronze to tin. It's probably a recycled aluminium can at the moment. Now, Martin, 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 I know we at some point we are going to bring up the, up the Barrett brothers because we do that every week. But I just look before we do go, I do just want to touch on the concussion issue. Big big story in America at the moment around the Miami Dolphins quarterback Tua, Tua Tunga Tunga Bailoa. Bailoa, yeah. picked up a big concussion against uh, the Buffalo Bills. Came back on the field literally in the second half, even though he was dancing with Mickey and Donald in Disneyland. Week later takes the field again, gets absolutely hammered, much more serious impact, this time against the Cincinnati Bengals. And somehow they're trying to make out that everything was done right, everything was okay in that first game. We had the right to bring him back out in the second half, and we had the right to pay him a week later. When are these clowns going to learn that when a player takes a head knock and they lose their cognitive ability, that they've had a brain injury? And if if they're not sure, and I'll keep saying this, would you put your own kid back out on the field? Would you put your own kid back out on the field a week later after having a brain injury? Why do they need to have these doctors? Why do they need to have these HIA tests? It's there for everybody to see. He's picked up a brain injury. Look after him. But no, no, the pressure of performance, the pressure of money, the pressure that must be put on these doctors. And then these coaches come out these coaches come out and defend it and say, no, we wouldn't change anything. We went through all the protocols. There are no protocols. You actually also have to set your systems up around perception and public perception. And I don't know any mum, any dad, who would agree with what's happened with the Miami Dolphins. And we see it a lot in rugby league. I was, to be fair, I was really pleased the All Blacks didn't play David Harvey or didn't play Sam Kane in that second Bledisloe Cup match after both taking head knocks the week earlier. And so, you know, there, there is there, there's a positive thing for New Zealand rugby. But you see it all the time in rugby league. Guys getting absolutely smashed, monstered, KO'd, and a week later back out on the field. And then they wonder why the lawsuits are coming along. And, you know, and, and they don't care whether in 50 years' time these guys are all suffering from some sort of dementia. It's appalling. And then they wonder why parents don't want their kids playing the game anymore. And numbers are in decline and other sports are benefiting from it, Martin. Devlin. Oh, how does he do that? How does he do that? The Platform.